Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. I haven't done a movie review in a while since Halloween, which I reviewed both uh, Monsters vs. Aliens along with its Halloween special. So I had to take some time in November to post some commercial breaks from KTTV, Fox 11 Los Angeles, uh, uh, during the airings of DuckTales at the time. So it was nice to find some more. Uh, from the 1989 uh, airings and it also includes Batman and and just a little bit of the real Ghostbusters so I'm just gonna try to continue to post some more if I can uh, not to mention I had to do some early Black Friday shopping um, we did went to Walmart right I did forgot to mention that we had to get a laptop computer for my mom she needed one so bad because uh, her laptop uh, broke. She was trying to struggle this hard to do her work so that's why she had to get one for that so that's cool. But we did however went to Sam's Club just to find a 4K TV. We tried to look for some at Walmart and even Target. No dice. So we finally got the 4K we always wanted. Yeah, so I had to pick the TCL one <laughs> that comes with the Roku. I think we were going to get the RCA one or we were going to get other brands like the Vizio and all but we, I decided to go for my own ideas so this was it and so I got one for myself and for my sister because she needed one so bad too and we all do I mean mostly because I have a 4K Ultra HD player to join in and plus I have an Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K so now I can actually play uh, two streaming devices to join there are some apps that are not included on the Amazon. <laughs> and then I bought uh, four movies uh, at Target. I wish I had bought more, but I figured I'm going to do that later on, you know, when we start doing some more Black Friday shopping, which I did uh, during last week, because I actually got some more at Walmart. Kind of disappointed, though, because they didn't have all the other 4Ks that I was hoping they would have. I mean, they only have a few, and... None of which kept my interest. So I just got Blu-rays and I got a few DVDs. That's all. Uh, maybe I'll show it to it uh, later. And but I did actually got an, another 4K to join uh, with um, two other movies. So I figured this is exactly what I had to continue to go with. But we'll see. Hopefully, maybe. Um, Maybe later in, on Black Friday, maybe I might find some more titles, and we'll see. Maybe I'll be able to get 4Ks for a lot less, if we're lucky. Okay, well anyway, uh, one of the Blu-rays I did pick up, uh, which I got at Target, and I showed you this early, last week when I posted the recorded video of it, is Explorers. The sci-fi fantasy about three boys who dreamed of uh, exploring everywhere they go with their spaceship that they built with known as the Thunder Road so now they get to head off to outer space so they get to meet aliens from another planet but they actually come directly through a spaceship and you can see it right here on this nice gorgeous cover art that they chose for the Shout Select uh, Collector's Edition to the set from Shout Factory yeah you get to see the Thunder Road you know that's um, clash in with this one magnetic force field bubble so I'll be able to fly it connects to it yes and you get to see the moon you get to see the clouds and the alien spaceship <laughs> really cool I love how they chose this that's how you do it right and you see the back again yeah even the spine <laughs> um, so now I'm going to take it out. The slip cover, yeah, they have the same cover too, uh, but it's a reversible cover, like all Shout Selects, or as well as Screen Factory, you know, and Shout Factory themselves. Although sometimes they don't, where they have a reversible cover art of the movie poster. This is what it used to look like when it came out, uh, but when it was on home video, they just show um, the free leads. Of the actors, you know, Ethan Hawke, River Phoenix, and Jason Preston. And it just show you the 
the Thunder Road. Um, but here they just show the uh, the picket fence uh, with the bicycle and the skateboard with the trash can, and it just shows this flash light that's that's brightening around uh, underneath your backyard. So they didn't want to show you that because you know that keeps it a secret. <laughs> It's like a Steven Spielberg production in a way. But it's directed by Joe Dante, the same man who gave us Gremlins. He also did The Howling. And then later he went on to do other films like Inner Space, uh, Gremlins 2, The New Batch, um, The Burbs, Madinee. Yeah, and of course he's the protege of uh, B-movie director, or maybe C-rated. <laughs> Roger Corman, yeah, and yeah, you can see the features uh, like I showed you already. It's the same, but just different um, screenshots. Uh, so of course you got um, both the home video, as everyone remembers uh, when it came out, because um, it developed a cult following, and the theatrical cuts as it came out in theaters. So they have certain different scenes here and there. Plus you got. Um, a new documentary, the science fiction fairy tale story of explorers, yeah, which includes new interviews. Uh, it had director Joe Dante to join with screenwriter Eric Luke. They got Ethan Hawke to join, and interesting enough, they got uh, offer Ernest Klein for Ready Player One because he's a super fan of this movie too. That's really cool. We get to see him, and we do get to see all the other people behind the film when they were working on it. Um, as they develop at Paramount Studios. Um, it's an hour-long documentary. It's very informative. They really explain how they did this film. They took some time, and then they, they talk about the troubles that they were going through, especially when it came out, um, and we're going to get to that when I talk about it. Uh, yes, we have new deleted scenes with optional commentary by Joe Dante. You can also see it um, without the commentary, but it's always nice to be more informative to hear what he had to say. Uh, but you get to see like a 33-minute uh, deleted scenes of all the shots that they could have included. I guarantee you that those scenes alone could have been used for the third act of the movie. Yeah, and that's what, what happened here, was that the film became totally rushed into production so it wasn't really finished at all yeah it was still left unfinished uh, mostly I think from the ending as opposed to certain scenes that could have been included so yes even Joe himself had uh, regret himself for not adding them but that's the problem when the studio was just so desperate uh, they demand them to stop editing and they had to rush it for its July release for the summer. Yeah, I was only three months old at the time. And this was the same month that Back to the Future came out. That was a huge hit. So the film became a box office bomb due to the fact that it had a stiff competition with Back to the Future as opposed to other summer films like The Goonies. And not only that, it got overshadowed by a Live Aid concert that was going around in July. So not many people went to see this movie, and that's a shame. But, however, uh, it did get criticized when it came out. Uh, yeah, it got mixed reviews. Uh, some of them was negative, but I think it started to you know, hold back over the years. I guess they got... Uh, they gave it a second look and I think they finally realized that it was a lot better than they thought. But yes, it developed a cult following over the years uh, since its home video release. And it had a lot of life from everyone for those who miss it out on theaters or for those who have seen it in theaters. And they loved it and, and they thought this is pays a tribute to you know the 50s style um, sci-fi fantasies and all. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you get to see the aliens and the fact that you see all these movies and all this other yeah, memorabilia of NASA and, and all. And the fact that you get this, you get a scientist who can create all these experiments. I mean, the knowing that this is going to be exactly what they've been dreaming for. And you get to see all these dream sequences, 
or they're flying up in the air and and then you begin to leer down into a circuit board and and how it all links to their dreams I thought wow I love that okay and yes they have interviews with the cinematographer John Hora who passed away recently sucks I know but luckily we got to see his final um, interview and then we got editor Tina Hirsch uh, she actually worked with Dante you know ever since um, they were at New World Pictures and I yeah with Roger Corman at the time and then of course we got the theatrical trailers so it's really cool um, this is a nice set and I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like um, right here you get disc one which is the which is basically film <laughs> The home video cuts. It does show you um, the Thunder Road um, flying around in outer space, and right here you get to see uh, Ethan Hawke just painting the the Thunder Road that they were building, and that's uh, this too, uh, the theatrical cut. So and yes, yeah, uh, underneath the the cover is the same as the the slip cover. So there you go. I love this. I'm so happy that it finally got a Blu-ray release it deserves and you know with all the hard work that they had to go through I mean this is it. They finally got it. Because I mean it had been on DVD for a long time uh, but it was mostly the theatrical cut that they got. Uh, the home video release um, is so rare so if you ever find it you have to go for it. Um, yeah the transfer of the movie well, it's not a 4K scan. That's okay. It doesn't have to be. It's basically just the HD print that they put out um, from Paramount uh, a couple years back. So they finally put it on Blu-ray. But they projected it uh, at 1 by 85 which the original uh, aspect ratio was 1 by 66 So now you probably notice why you know, the, the actors started to look a little flat. Um, that's probably the way they wanted it to be <laughs> somehow. I mean, that's typical. I, I understand because they had all the geometrically issues here and there with with several scenes here, including the bubble and all, but it doesn't bother me. I, I can live with that. I mean, at least the transfer itself uh, isn't so bad at all. Some people may have said that it might have had DNR issues or so, but I don't think that's the case. It didn't look that bad. I mean, it's clean, but it's not too bad it had some grain in it and I'm sure the home video cut um, had developed the same so they probably got it from another source but either way uh, I love it I, I love the set I'm so glad it got one it deserves it really uh, needed a blu-ray really bad so I mean now that Paramount has a deal with shell select I really hope we can start getting more titles these days because this is exactly why we need more Another film I really would love to see on Blu-ray for sure is is Daryl, and if that gets like a let's say a shelf select release or maybe perhaps a shelf factory release by themselves, I'd love to pick that up someday. Otherwise, they'll probably give it to another company, but who knows? <laughs> okay, so let's begin with the review. It stars Ethan Hawke, River Phoenix, uh, Jason Preston, Amanda Peterson of uh, course who went on to do the movie Can't Buy Me Love. Sadly she passed away. God rest his, God rest her soul. Uh, Bobby Fitt, uh, Dana Irie, yeah you may remember her from the Addams Family movies and Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. I believe she was in the movie called The Color Purple Monitors. Uh, Talazan Jaffe, James Cromwell, yes from Babe. Uh, among other films he's done, yeah, he was even in the uh, episodes of All in the Family, and and uh, I think he was also in Barney Miller. Uh, but he went on to do other films like Star Trek First Content, L.A. Confidential, The Green Mile, uh, Space Cowboys, and many others. <laughs> Robert Picardo, yep, I know, because he's been in several Joe Dante films. Um, but of course he went on to do Star Trek Voyager, he was on the Wonder Years, um, he, 
And I know he's been in other stuff too, like China Beach. Karen uh, Mayo Chandler, uh, Dick Miller, you know, also have been uh, a regular for Joe Dante too, for, for his films. But he's also done other stuff too. He's no longer with us, of course. But he's a great actor. Um, he also had work with James Cameron and Martin Scorsese too. So it's nice to know that he, you know, he's done a lot of great work. Um, another actor who also is no longer with us is Mishak Taylor. Yeah, he was from the TV show Designing Woman. He played the character Hollywood in the Mannequin films. I love him in that movies, in those films. Uh, and I know he was actually friends with uh, actor Joe Mantegna. Uh, nice to know. As I figure he had appeared in episodes of Criminal Minds, I think. Um, so it's a shame. Uh, Mary Kate Place, uh, it was in the TV show Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, among other stuff. Uh, Leslie Wickard, um, book um, Bunny, and um, Bradley Gregg, uh, who of course went on to do uh, the movie Class of 99, which I also bought recently <laughs> on Blu-ray, so I'm going to talk about that uh, maybe later when I get a chance. Yeah, it's written by Eric Luke, which is actually sort of based upon his um, original story that he came up with. I think because he was a kid at heart, so this is starting to focus on that. And it's directed by Joe Dante. Oh, and I guess I forgot to mention that uh, originally the film was going to be directed by Wolfgang Peterson. Um, yes, the director of The Never Ending Story. They were going to have the film being set uh, somewhere in Germany, so they couldn't do that. So he was dropped, and that's how they got Joe Dante. The movie begins, set in a suburban Maryland town, we meet a young preteen boy named Ben Crando, who's played by Ethan Hawke, who of course is fascinated by, you know, space memorabilia that he has in his bedroom. You know, he's actually dreamt of becoming an astronaut someday, but he has to go to space camp, so he has to promise his parents to do so. Um, he loves sci-fi movies. Yeah, he watches The War of the Worlds, uh, the H.T. Wells adaptation from 1953. Yeah, classic, by the way. You have all these spaceships and all shooting around. And he does collect a lot of comic books and other stuff that he has in his room. But one night... Uh, He's been experiencing vivid dreams about flying through the clouds and then wants up in this city-like circuit board where it has all these diagrams and other electrical circuits around and then he goes directly into this loophole and once he woke up he starts to draw all these sketches that he remembers. So he'll be able to show it to his child prodigy and scientist uh, named Wolfgang Miller, yeah, his best friend, uh, played by Weber Phoenix. So at school, um, Ben actually develops uh, a huge crush on this beautiful girl named Lori Swenson, who's played by Amanda Peterson. But of course, he got into a run-in with a bunch of bullies that's led by Steve Jackson, who's played by Bobby Fight. Um, if you saw the theatrical cut, uh, there was an early scene where uh, Wolfgang was about to bring out several of his books, you know, he was headed off to school, but he got in a run-in. Uh, they threw his books around into the, the grassy field, and then, you know, Ben finally came, you know, bought his bike, and he had to take some of the books to, so they can head off to continue. Yeah. Therefore, um, yes, uh, Ben got beat up by Steve Jackson until surprisingly uh, we meet a punkish but very likable Darren Woods who's played by Jason Preston who saved his life. So they both share the same circuit board concepts because apparently they link with the dream or the fact that they were figuring this out but we also learned that Darren doesn't dream much. <laughs> That's the case. But he also lives uh, with his abusive father, who just came back 
Um, let's not talk about that. Therefore, um, they went to Wolfgang's uh, house. Uh, we met their parents. We met his parents, who are German. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Miller, played by James Cromwell and Dana Ivory, along with their kids to join. So they went down to the basement just to show Wolfgang's latest experiment, which they built an actual microchip that's based upon Ben's drawings, which then enables the generation of an electromagnetic bubble that's flying around at several speeds yeah, with the control of the computer that he has. Of course, accidentally, uh, his cat uh, jumps through the... the uh, through the keyboards and then suddenly it starts to speed around going out of control the electricity uh, went out so now they have to go outside to see if they can try to control it uh, later on uh, when they went all the way top on top of the hill with the tree and they tested it out themselves and this is where when Ben was trying it out you know with Darren suddenly uh, <laughs> Wolfgang wants up inside the bubble and he was flying around at that speed until it went up all the way down into the hole yeah where you saw a gopher <laughs> that was cool so their plan was you know they're gonna about to build a spaceship they had to go to this um, junkyard where they could find you know several parts that they need to use um, so they found this abandoned til tilt a world car that's probably from a carnival and that's where they put it all together and they named the ship the Thunder Road named after a Bruce Springsteen song they it did explain that too uh, if you saw the the uh, documentary on the blu-ray that Eric Luke is a big fan of Bruce Springsteen you know the boss himself and so he met him um, several times and thought this would be perfect for this <laughs> actual story so of course Ben continues to dream about the circuit board, finding this one diagram on the side. It all links to Wolfgang and um, Darren too, so they all share the same dream. So it, they discover that they need to use uh, unlimited sustained oxygen. So that would mean that means they have to use the gas mask to the yeah, oxygen mask actually. <laughs> to actually be able to fly this entire Thunder Road. But of course, you know, they were afraid that this this might fall apart. So they're hoping they're gonna try it out for themselves when they did this one test. So once they went inside, they brought in, you know, all their goodies and everything. They try out the Thunder Road for themselves and it worked. They actually flew around everywhere throughout the entire city. And they even flew around into the local drive-in where they were watching this uh, 50s style sci-fi film uh, yeah which you have Robert Ricardo uh, yeah, playing this uh, this space uh, <laughs> hero uh, yeah because they're, they're going around flying all these aliens yeah you see these alien ships I mean the way they did this was just incredible uh, <laughs> so unfortunately though uh, the Thunder Road went out of control and it went straight into the snack bar and that's where you do see the bullies again, you know, Steve Jackson and the rest. <laughs> so what do you know? They got their karma. So they flew around and then they got to run in with the, uh, this one helicopter pilot, you know, joining in with the other, um, which is uh, Charlie Drake, played by Dick Miller, along with Gordon Miller, played by Meshach Taylor. So they spotted it. So now he's beginning to become very suspicious about the ship that he spotted last night. So then he goes around trying to find where the ship is located and that's where he found it somehow. Because he also learned that, you know, he was a kid once too. You know, he dreamed about uh, uh, exploring some UFO that's going around. So of course no one will probably believe him or whatever. Uh, therefore, um, once they try to continue their mission to go on the Thunder Road once again, um, so they can try it out to see if maybe they'll be able to go all the way up to outer space. Um, yes, at this point on, Ben did got to run in with um, 
Charlie, so... And Ben was afraid that Charlie was going to attack him, but luckily he was on a roll. He finally went um, to the Thunder Road with um, Wolfgang and Darren, so they flew off. And, of course, he was very amazed that now they're finally going off to their mission. So they went all the way up to outer space, and then they wound up being taken directly into this alien spaceship. And that's where we, they went inside and, and they began to explore what was going on. I mean, they're being taken in several levels here and there. Uh, there's this one um, alien creature, um, a robotic type. Yeah, it's, it was a robot that... Oh yeah, there was that... Uh, yeah, it was the, uh, the giant spider <laughs> that uh, came by... Pretty much acts like a cop, you know, just checking to see some identification and all. You know, checking their back pockets, you know, front pockets here and there. You, you, you know that. So they try to escape from that. And then next thing you know, we see two aliens uh, joining by. Um, yeah, one has a, a personality of all these uh, all these TV personality uh, actors that we often see, you know, like like comedians or... And all this other stuff too, because they actually watch TV. You see this huge screen where it's playing all these um, shows uh, the Americans do watch, of course. Uh, a lot of switching channels uh, going around, and then you see this beautiful uh, alien too. Uh, that's a girl. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Wolfgang was found too, and they're falling in love too. Um, uh, anyway, um, they were actually, uh, the, the alien's name is Wak, and um, the uh, other uh, alien is named Neek, and we begin to find out that they have their fodder too, so yes, uh, they thought it was going to be space pirates, but it wasn't the case. Then they also explained about, you know, how how Americans and humans around attack all the aliens around like they're not getting along with them but they realize that it was only just in the movies so it's not like it's gonna happen let's hope not because then that's gonna be a problem so then um, things were not working out as it seems um, they wish they had stayed longer but they knew they had to go because they're not welcome here so they head off back straight to Earth, and now that's when they landed straight into the river where, sadly, the Thunder Road uh, had drowned. And um, yeah, that's where, this is where they complained about the Ferdak that they couldn't get because we wanted to see what happens next after they finally made it back to Earth. Uh, because at this point on, we learned that uh, Ben actually has um, a, interesting enough, uh, he had a, um, he had this one um, neck brace that he got uh, from Wack, and so that way he'll be remembered by, and that's where he begins to see how it starts to glow, light and all. Um, he also receives this uh, message from his girlfriend, Lori, where he found out that... Because it turns out that Lori actually knew about what they were doing. You know, they they flew from the spaceship and they said, have a nice trip. <laughs> but I guess it kind of leads to what was going to happen next. Because then there's another third dream sequence where now not only is Ben flying up in the air, but also... His friends, Wolfgang, Darren, and of course, Lori. So they're all flying up, all the way up in the air, going to their next journey. And that's how the film ends. Um, very beautiful. Um, I do agree, though. I really wish there were more to the story in the third act, because it did feel pretty rushed. I, I feel like they could have tried to make the ending more sustained, but I understand. I mean, it was really sad that they lost the Thunder Road at the end. Um, but I was hoping they were going to come back too. 
So if you have to watch the deleted scenes, which I know the quality isn't very good, that's fine, but I can live with it. Um, you do get to see some more scenes uh, that that were left off in the cut, so they could have been included. That one scene um, where they finally get even with those bullies, I thought, man, that could have been perfect for the this, the third act alone. Was when you know we get to uh, see them get their revenge on them, where because Steve Jackson have gave them wedgies and all, that now he finally gets what he deserves. I would have loved to see that in action, and and I would have loved to see a lot of great scenes too, like when uh, Ben was trying to get to know um, Lori uh, from a birthday party um, before we learned that she wasn't ready for it. So that was a pivotal moment that Dante wanted to leave in, but he couldn't, and he regret for cutting that scene out. But I know that's the problem. The studio kept rushing it so fast, so it's their fault for that reason. Um, but I thought Joe Dante did a great job directing this movie, and he did a he did an amazing job trying to capture the spirit of um, of all these coming of age uh, sci fi fantasies that he did. I mean, who who wants to dream of becoming an astronaut and wants to explore the entire outer space? You know, you want to go from a different planet, or you want to explore all these aliens that you see, or any other. You want to get to know everyone here. <laughs> I love that. Uh, the special effects, uh, they were done visually by IOM, you know, Industrial Light and Magic, you know, that were owned by uh, the Lucasfilm Limited uh, company. Uh, they did an excellent job creating the special effects. I mean, it's ahead of its time, I know, but they did an excellent job. I mean, I love all the, the, the movements and all, and the flying sequences was was breathtaking, incredible. I love the way the the ship moves with the electrical magnetic uh, bubble that they created. Uh, well, Wolfgang created, of course, and they fly around. I mean, a lot of great special effects back in the '80s that they had done compared to the the effects they use in today's movies. And the cast itself were terrific. I mean, Ethan Hawke. This was his first film, I believe. Um, he went on to become a very successful uh, actor. Done a lot of great films that I love. And I know he's done some bad films too, but... But he was terrific in this movie, and he still is today. Um, if it wasn't for him, for this movie, I mean, he wouldn't be the actor we all know today. Um, but... I love his performance in the film and, you know, as Ben, I mean, he, I could definitely see what we all feel. I mean, we all want to go to space. We all want to do what we want in our lives. So he's incredible. Um, River Phoenix was also terrific as uh, the child prodigy Wolfgang. I mean, it's great that, you know, you have a scientist who's smart and intelligent, um, you know, with his glasses and all. I mean, you can definitely tell. I mean, he gets paranoid sometimes, but he could do whatever he can <laughs> to see if, if everything can work. So he knows what he's doing. Uh, Jason Preston, you know, underrated child actor. He was excellent as Darren. You know, I love the fact that you got this tough guy who can save his friends and all. I mean, yeah, they're all three of them may be nerds, but they're cool. I mean, it, they really bond with each other, you know. They're likable. You you care for them a lot. Um, but he also loves 80s music that he listens to uh, on his uh, stereo, you know, with headphones and all, or the cassette player. And um, he does have a bit of a James Dean type role here, so it's perfect. Amanda Peterson can never be this beautiful, and I really miss her too. I mean. I don't blame Ben for having a crush on her as Lori. I mean, I, I do wish, you know, there were more scenes of her, too. And they get to know each other. I mean, I know it's hard. Um, Bobby Fight, uh, Steve Jackson, yeah, he was... I mean, he sure did play a really huge jerk. The way he's been treating them and all. 
but he gets his uh, apples. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, also, uh, there were other actors uh, that could have been in the movie, too, Ooh, but I think that they were in the deleted scenes. Uh, we learned that uh, Ben actually had a father, too, and he had a brother. Um, so, unfortunately, I don't think they weren't in both cuts either, but we did learn that he had a mother, uh, Mrs. Crandall, yeah, played by Mary Kate Brace, so she's great. It's funny how, you know, we begin to see, you know, that he doesn't only live with his mom, but, yeah, that's another example why it was all rushed. Um, a lot of great scenes, a lot of memorable moments, I love the aliens too, I mean, they were great. I just wish they were in there more. Uh, I, I love all these uh, keen humor that they put into it in that particular style. I love the, the moments too where they show this uh, 50s style uh, sci-fi movie that they were watching at the drive-in. Um, <laughs> uh, you could tell that you know they were out of sync uh, with their performances here and and they show all these spaceships and all. Uh, also done by Agawam and everything. Um, it, it's just such a beautiful film. And oh yeah, and don't forget about the score that's done by Jerry Goldsmith too. Wonderful score. Uh, very um, highly breathtaking to write. Some of the themes, uh, like for example, the, the main theme, which I think it's also in the end credits too. Uh, actually it is. It almost sounds similar to uh, Star Trek, actually. Yeah, because he did do the score for the Star Trek movies, uh, as which would later become the the main theme for Star Trek: The Next Generation. So I knew some of those beats sounded very familiar, <laughs> but it really works so well for explorers, and and the rest of the the scores are just terrific. Uh, beautiful cinematography by John Horg. I was just so great editing by Tina Hirsch. Everything that went around. Um, Excellent writing by Eric Luke. He really knew what he was doing. I know he made a cameo appearance, but it was only in the... Yeah, yeah. I, I think he was the... But I think they had Book Bundy playing the science teacher, but I know he had a cameo appearance on in the deleted scenes. So, here we go. Here we go. Uh, so, they did a great job. I, I really enjoy this movie. And I'm glad to hear that it got a 74% on Rotten Tomatoes. Really deserves it now, compared to all the criticism it got when it came out. So it got better over the years. And I'm glad it got more love than hate. I mean, it's a very eccentric um, sci-fi coming-of-age fantasy story that you all know and love. And I'm glad Joe Dante did this. I mean, come on. I mean, after his success with Gremlins... This should be more memorable as well. I mean, I love the humor of other... Um, there, there's also uh, another thing about the aliens, let's go back to that, was they also throw in a lot of sound effects from other TV shows. And I know he's a big fan of Looney Tunes, so... Yeah, he, he always throws in, you know, a sound effect, a sound clip of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought that was a nice charm. They even show some scenes of Looney Tunes uh, in this huge TV screen. <laughs> yeah. And I always love how his character walk. You know, he broke, he breaks the fourth wall. I mean, this alien is just... Basically, he has antennas, and he has this huge belly. You know, the green. Same girl goes with Neek, this beautiful alien with his huge lips. Also, a big belly, and... And some lovely, beautiful uh, eyebrows, you know, some eyelashes, you know, with mascara and all. <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, you get to see the fodder. So, they were just like us. <laughs> That's what we expected. <laughs> but aliens can look different uh, in several ways. So. Anyway, <laughs> so that's Explorers. Wonderful. And a childhood favorite of mine, too fantasy trip and I give the movie four and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later. Bye.